Hi everybody, welcome to Paint Carry Paint. In this episode, we are going to talk about how to make things round, how to turn the form. And to do that, we have to first start at the beginning. And in the beginning, there was black. And then transparent red oxide followed by titanium white. And these are the only colors that we're gonna use for this entire video. Mixing my brown and my black, I can start to get the shadow values. We're gonna make a value scale. There's a divisional edge between the light and the shadows. Mixing my reddish brown with white, I can get a generic Caucasian flesh tone and then simply by going thinner and thicker with my paints, I can get lighter and darker values. There's the half tone. The half tone is the plane in between the light and shadow, which helps to turn the form in between lights and shadows on the form. So now that we have our value scale, Let's apply that to the ball. So if we turn the light on from the left towards the right, we get a form shadow on the right side of the ball and a cast shadow running along the ground. And then I'll go ahead and mass in the entire light mass with an initial layer of flesh tone, rubbing out some of the paint for that half tone and then adding some thicker and more white as the ball turns towards the light and gets lighter in value. Reestablishing my terminating edge between the light and the shadow on the form. There's my reflected light in the back on the far right. This is the form shadow. The form shadow and there's the cast shadow. Form shadows and cast shadows act differently. Each of these values is a plane. It's good to remember that. That will help us to think architecturally, there's the highlight, and not simply blending everything. By the way, if you are enjoying the content here, please like and subscribe. And if you know any artists out there that you think would benefit from this lesson, then please share it with them. It goes a long ways towards helping me grow this channel. Much appreciated. Now you can see that we so far on this particular ball, we've pulled the light towards us a little more, giving us more light mass area and less of a form shadow. And I have simplified all of my shadows into one flat shadow tone. This is what we call the graphic shape. The graphic shape in the beginning helps us to see the drawing before we start plowing into different values. Cast shadows tend to be darker than form shadows. And that's because form shadows, as you can see, have reflected lights, which make them a little bit lighter. Now, as I work out of my form shadow and up towards the light, there's my half tone, my dark light, half tone, dark light, and then my initial mid middle light. Now I'm gonna add some more white and some thicker paint, giving me a lighter light and a lightest, lightest light. And finally, the highlight. This exercise follows the basic laws of light on form. And is not very different from what I imagine computer animation does. It's the same understanding. This is just an old fashioned way of doing it. Now that cast shadow will tend to be a sharper edge, but as that cast shadow gets further away, the cast shadow edge will get softer. 
for our last ball demo, we're going to push the light further away from us, pointed, pointed at ourselves a bit more, giving us a much larger area of shadow and a much smaller area of light mass. And just as we have done on our previous two exercises, simplifying to one basic shadow, one basic light tone, giving us a graphic shape. And now, starting to darken my cast shadow, including the dark accent right under the ball, which is our darkest value. As the form shadow turns towards us, it's gonna catch more and more reflected light making the underside of the form shadow the lightest value in the shadows. However, it's still in the shadow and should always still be darker than anything happening on the light side of the ball, which is often forgotten about. Is a common mistake making reflected lights too bright. I'll start to build some lighter tones on the light side of the ball as I model up the value scale and towards my light source. This is called modeling towards the light. Usually in old master painting, there's my half tone softening that transition a little bit between the light and the shadow on the form without losing my terminating edge. And finally, the highlight. Softening the edge of my cast shadow as it gets further away. And now we can apply this information to a portrait painting Using the exact same palette, I'm going to be painting from an old vintage black and white photograph and thinking about the head as a ball, I will start off by blocking in the shadow side of the ball, the cast shadow falling onto the throat another form shadow on the back of the neck, etc., And blocking in to begin with the entire mass of light with a basic flush tone. I like to always work with two brushes. I keep one brush for my shadows and another brush for my light mass. This is very helpful for keeping our tones between the shadow and the light from crossing over. In general, you want your values from your lights and your shadow side to always remain separate. So everything in the shadows is darker and everything in the lights is lighter. Going back again to what we talked about a moment ago, the, the reflected light and not letting the shadows reflected light get too light and start to look like it's a part of the light mass. So I'm gonna go ahead here and start to find some of the basic landmarks for the features. My center line is pushed way over to the left. And I started off with a few grid lines to just get an idea of where the eye sockets, nose, mouth, and then pretty quickly moving back to working with shapes. Now shapes and lines are basically the same thing. You can use shapes to get lines or you can use lines to get shapes. But essentially you're working with flat proportions either way. Speaking of flat proportions, that's pretty much how I am approaching the features 
at this point, blocking in the flat graphic shape of my shadows and darker lights. One of the secrets, I would say, to getting accurate drawing is being able to see everything as a flat abstraction. So if you can see everything as a flat abstraction, all of your proportions, values, and colors will be more accurate. At this point, still refining my shapes, refining my drawing, establishing where the shadows are, where the lights are, a little bit more drawing there on that far eye. Really want to make sure that my shapes, my graphic shapes of light and shadow are as well placed as possible before I start moving into expanding the value range. So I'll stay here with the basic graphic shape of light and shadow until I feel comfortable moving forward. And beginning to move forward now, I'm using a dry brush, which would be a third brush to pull some of the paint off uh, in the light mass. Any of the areas where the light gets dimmer, gets darker, is turning away from the light source and beginning to head towards the shadows, I can actually pull some of that flesh tone back off, which is gonna reveal the gray underneath, which is gonna help for me to darken and cool off those darker lights. The tonality in the light mass, the color in the light mass, the only color we're really dealing with in this exercise is flesh tone, a basic flesh tone. But as that basic color of flesh tone turns away from the light, it's gonna get darker and less chromatic. So it's gonna get darker and more gray or more muddy. The color will become less clean as it turns towards the shadow and is getting less light. And then as the light turns, as the surface turns towards the light, the color actually gets cleaner and brighter before heading towards the highlight. I take the opportunity here to start working on the shirt. I thought it'd be nice to include the white of the shirt, which kind of frames up the head I think you see that a lot in old master paintings. If you imagine those old Dutch paintings with the big white frilly collars that people would wear, it was almost like the head was like a flower, you know, and it's like this displaying the head or something. It's kind of kind of interesting. So I still think that in portrait painting, you know, having a little bit of the collar is kind of, you know, it, then you have the, the portrait, the head is the is sort of the flower, the adornment. Um, but blocking in the shirt here is exactly the same as the ball, even though it's not as round as the ball was. The same rules apply. So blocking in my lights and shadows as graphic shapes first. Thinking about whether the shadow is a form shadow or a cast shadow. And then as I begin to manipulate my tones, in the lights, for example, here, darkening it down where the light is getting a little bit darker. Is it a mid light? Is it a lighter light? Those are some lighter lights there, kind of grabbing a few lighter lights. And I'll leave that pretty abbreviated down there on the shirt. And then back up on the portrait, my first mark was to establish the highlight on the forehead. 
now that I am ready to start modeling in the lights, it's often good to sort of drop in one of your strongest highlights first, because this gives you an idea of what you are shooting for. You're, you're gonna model up towards the strongest lights ending at the highlight, of course. So establishing that highlight lets me know what I'm shooting for, what I'm building up to. A few more highlights on the tip of the nose, corner of the mouth there. Now some of these lights are probably may not all be highlights. Some of them might be what we would call a lighter light, which is the surface of the ball that's getting the most light but not necessarily a highlight. So it's just not quite as bright as the highlight, but it is the surface of the ball. The surface of the ball is different than the highlight. Everything else is the surface of the ball. It's a value either going lighter towards the light or darker turning away from the light. The highlight is independent. Now I'm taking advantage of my red paint here in a, and using a little less white and a little bit more of the reddish brown oxide, allowing a little bit of that red to sort of play a role here on my portrait and letting some of the more fleshy areas like the nose and the cheeks and the ear and the lips and the eyes a little bit, get a little more red. So I'm really trying to sort of expand the color range of my palette here. And then again, now tapping into some of my blacks to get more of a gray at the halftone, which is also expanding the range of my very simple palette. Trying to go a little bit more into the reds and at times going a little more into the grays. All of this is happening in the light mass, by the way. The light is really where the action happens in most paintings. Most paintings, the, the action is in the light mass and the shadows tend to be a little more quiet. It's not always true, but most of the time that's the case, which is also why in this portrait, I've kept my shadows all transparent brown. And you can see that reflected light under the chin. That's by pulling the paint back off of the of the uh, with a brush revealing more of the gray coming through so by using less transparent paint i can make values lighter in the shadow and that also helps them to differentiate the shadow from the light and so this way the light the reflected lights in my shadows don't really compete with the reflected uh, with the lights on the light side of the form. Even my half tone should still be lighter than my reflected light. Now, as we get into smaller shapes, the laws of the light on the ball still apply. Every surface is either on the light side of the form or the shadow side of the form, all the way down to the smallest information and details you can see. It all follows the same laws of light on form. When you're working from one dominant light source, which is what we have here, and most old master academic painting is one dominant light source. You might have a secondary light source. By the way, the blue in the eye is gray. I'm using gray, I'm using black and white paint to achieve that color, which is kind of amazing how blue it looks when it's the coolest color on the painting. So even as I get into these smaller areas of structure and architecture, anatomy, planes.
I'm still thinking about where, I'm, where am I on the ball? Am I in the light or am I in the shadow? If I'm on, in the light mass, where on the light am I? Where on the ball am I? Is it a half tone? Is it a dark light? Is it a mid light? Is it a lighter light? Is it a highlight? If it's in the shadow, is it a form shadow? Or is it a cast shadow? Form shadows are the underside or the backside of the form that's, that's turning away from the light and turns into the shadow. That's your form shadow. Form shadow edges tend to be softer because it's a part of the turning surface of the ball. Cast shadows tend to be sharper uh, because they are casting away from the objects, from the contour of the object, and you see the contours of the object. Your sharpest edges in any painting happen on the cast shadow and the contours. Now, which one is sharper? Well, that might have to be another video, but you can see in the eye socket, I've gone back to the graphic shape of my shadow. Anytime you get lost or you need to rebuild, just, just smudge everything out, go back to your shadow shape, and block in your abstract flat shadow shape, and then build back out of that towards the light. That's the old master classical academic way of working for the last 600 years. Now, as I begin to work in smaller areas, again, I always know where on the ball I am at any moment. I know if I'm working with my shadow brush, or my light mess, or my light brush, or if I'm using a dry brush to blend a little bit, which, you know, it's kind of a bad habit, but sometimes I do it. But I can move around and start to model the surface, whether it's getting lighter, turning towards the light, or darker, turning away from the light, or is it rolling into a half tone, into a form shadow? I always know where I am on the ball at any moment. This is a very good exercise for practicing both flesh tones and also modeling towards and away from the light source. As far as modeling goes, it's very similar to doing a cast painting. If, if you're familiar with the academic exercise of cast painting, black and white cast painting, this is basically the same thing, except we've introduced a simple flesh tone. We've introduced a warm color, which is a reddish brown, and a cool color, which is black and white or gray. So there's a little bit of warm cool happening in this painting, but it's mostly built with values. Managing my shapes and my proportions, which again, abstraction is the key for accuracy of drawing, flat abstraction. And this is monochromatic color using an extremely simple flesh tone. Simply adding white to a reddish brown is about the simplest flesh tone you can, you can do. At this point, the portrait is pretty much done. This is a one day painting and I'm just gonna work on a few things here 
to bring it home. Right now, I seem to be reinforcing my form shadow there a little bit, occasionally reinforcing the contour a little bit. I don't want to overdo that contour edge because otherwise it'll start to feel like it's a cutout and you want to avoid that. Working on my pushing that highlight just a little bit more right at the end. Some of the hair and the light there, just kind of rubbing some of that paint back off. And allowing some of the reddish hues of the paint and the grays of the canvas to create a new tone for the light in the hair. Trying to push some of the form modeling a little bit more right at the end here, just increasing the light on some, on some of the sub forms. Sharp edge there at the cast shadow under the neck. And just pushing some of those highlights a little bit more there. Modeling the light on the nose. I lost the highlight on the nose when I remodeled it modeled right over top of that highlight and then came back and reestablished the highlight on the nose over again. Rather than trying to paint around the highlight, it's better to just rebuild the modeling on the surface and then drop the highlight back on again at the very end. And there's the light in the eye. And that is going to do it for us, folks. So here is my finished Alla Prima portrait painting using a generic flesh tone and using the light on the ball exercise as our guide. Thank you, everybody, if you made it all the way to the end of this video. I hope that you found this video to be enlightening and helpful in your practice of painting and art making. And I'll see you on the next one. Adios.